Your Partner in Success Radio is a free business podcast with host Denise Griffiths. It's all about great stories, conversation, and context to help you move your business and life forward with actionable tips and advice from her guest experts. To listen and subscribe, just find us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your podcasts. Welcome to your partner in success video. I'm your host, Denise Griffiths, and this podcast is ranked in the top 2% of the most popular podcasts globally. And honestly, it's all because of my truly incredible guests. And I feel so fortunate to spend time with people who are at the top of their game and who are passionate about helping you achieve your goals in both your personal and professional lives. My guests hold nothing back. They show up here to share the secrets of peak performance with us. And I know you will find their insights both inspiring and actionable. So sit back, relax, take notes, and get ready to take your life and business to the next level. And today, this is an interesting topic to me because it's something we all talk about, whether we know anything at all about it, and that's supply chain. So my guest today, John Mink, is a business veteran with over 30 years of experience, 20 of which were spent in supply chain, and he has also achieved great success in breaking down traditional organizational barriers that can succeed, impede success in companies, particularly within the realm of supply chain. So through trial, error, and continuous learning, which is something we should all do, John has been privileged to shepherd both large and small organizations in driving improvements through their sales and operations processes, boosting both the customer experience and financial results. I've got his book in front of me. That book is called Forecasting with Outliers, O-U-T-Liars, L-I-A-R-S, Mitigating, (laughs) that's important, Mitigating Blame, Bias, and Apathy in Your Planning Process. So thank you, John, for being here. Um, As we were just chatting in my virtual green room, about the only thing I know about supply chain is that we all complain about it in the grocery store. You hear it. It's floating in the air. Ah. There's no no dog food supply chain. I'm, let's talk about that. Okay. Hey, thanks for having me, Denise, by the way. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. It is. So this is a uh, very fascinating topic uh, that we're into, and we like to paint, paint this broad brush of supply chain issues. And if you look at it, supply chains are very, very complex animals. And at the end of the day, Having product at the right place at the right time is a result of thousands of variables that have to get us there. So you've got to have all your, uh, you got to have your product ready. You got to have your design ready. You've got to have labor. You've got to have transportation. You've got to have a market for it. There's thousands of variables have to happen to get it to the, uh, the in this case, the grocery store shelf. And what is, uh, has been, something we've taken for granted for a long time. When COVID hit worldwide and we lost the labor, uh, labor pool, you can see such a huge impact on what has uh, now transpired into a lot of rising costs. And still, we have many products that we're out of stock on. And then the other part is we have many products with this huge surpluses around. So it's uh, been quite the fascinating journey to go through this time period when uh, we've lacked uh, labor around the world that's got us to the situation we're in today. And so to me, if we haven't learned anything from this, then we, uh, we're not doing our jobs. No kidding. When you say there's surpluses, uh, give me a few. My brain just okay. blank. It's like, okay, I was just in the grocery store. I'm not seeing surplus. That's about my only point of reference. I'm oh, warning you right now. I call it here is that the, uh, the easiest way for me to get uh, orders is to say, hey, well, there's a shortage. <laughs> so oh. human nature, right? Human nature will overreact. And so if you remember, we uh, – Boy, the toilet paper go crazy uh, during. Uh, I remember. Didn't it, right? Look, oh, I, so I had our. Okay, what happened? It's crazy. Everybody people were up toilet paper. People were right? bartering. So that's that was a insane. Very, this, uh, a very big need. Now, if uh, you look at it, not really much of an issue anymore. There's 
plenty of people stacked up for years on toilet paper. In some ways, there could be a bunch of surpluses out there. Same with uh, goods for the uh, holidays, uh, the Christmas holidays, the the, uh, the holidays you have in December. You'll see a bunch of goods that uh, were planned for it. And there's so many surpluses coming from that seasonality effect. So it's a it's fascinating to see that um, we have uh, both shortages, but there are a bunch of surpluses sitting as well. See, and I wondered about the whole toilet paper thing. I live in hurricane the hurricane zone, you know, six months of the year, we're under hurricane watch. It's hurricane season. So I always stock up. I have water, candles, batteries, toilet paper, paper sure. goods, dog food. I mean, that's just normal around here. But I did during COVID go ahead and say, okay, I'll stock up a little bit. But I watched people going, oh, you know, I've got toilet paper. What do you want to trade? Nothing. I don't want to <laughs> trade toilet paper. <laughs> We kind of lost our minds. Well, but you, but you kind of look at it. You set into some type of, you know, in some way, mass panic. I mean, we all felt it. Um, uh, we, we actually all felt it. And grocery stores had to lock down so you can't buy this much. Because uh, the reality is, um, especially the, the the ones that were proactive and trying to uh, uh, be safe, we've basically, um, you know, created a, a panic where. If you really looked at it, I don't know how many people really ran out of toilet paper, but it did create some type of panic. And therefore, right, the, the sales of toilet paper, if everything they could produce was produced. But now when you get into a point where it gets, things start getting back to normal, the demand's down because everyone's got toilet paper. So it's, a, it's just as an example of uh, uh, demand and supply. And a lot of times this, I call it, unnecessary or freak out demand is created for some way well like i call it the best way to create an order is say there's a shortage and that uh but that will then again eventually bite you and that's really really important so when you're planning you can't use the COVID event as a baseline to what you need to do in the future because there's many pieces that um you know when it came to uh, COVID. Many items became very, very important and mediums didn't. So if you look at that period in time and say, yeah, that, look at our new sales, that was actually done by an event that was not only really done how businesses normally run. That makes sense. And I hadn't even thought about that. I mean, I knew, yeah, I was watching, I was already prepped. I mean, I, I tend to be very well stocked because of hurricanes, but mm-hmm. I watched people around me just seriously panicking and fights would break out in the grocery stores. It got ugly. It really <laughs> did. Yeah. Uh, and it, 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 again, it is a, it's just a, it's a, this a fascinating, you know, experience of just on, you know, just the, the psychological nature of, um, you know, of uh, how we operate as human beings. And yes, it's a, uh, quite the, it's quite the, I can say this whole experience was fascinating you know, it did two things. I think it brought out, you know, like the good in people and also put out the worst in people at the same time. And it's uh, it's been quite the uh, polarizing effect uh, going through this period. But I'll keep coming back to this. If we haven't learned anything about this, uh, where we source, how we source, how we forecast, then we uh, how we actually manage cash flows or inventories, right? Uh, what visibility we have um, to our our supply, where it sits in the channel, then we haven't done our job. And uh, and I think this is going to be a great changing, a game changing moment for companies that okay, how do we not repeat this again? Will be there another pandemic? Probably somewhere. Will there be oh, some yeah. type of global war? Yeah, we know there's already one. Uh, that uh, even in the war in the Ukraine uh, with uh, with Russia, that's taken natural uh, natural material out, and that's caused many supply chain disruptions and costs uh, that uh, were not there. So as this world continues on, if we haven't learned from these type of events, uh, then shame on us. And you know, you mentioned something very important. There will be another pandemic or another scare. It's there's going to be war. Where there are humans, there are going to be troubles. That's just all yep. there is to it. That's how we operate. 
Oh, man, I and, wonder and about that sometimes, but the psychology is fascinating. But it, but it, but even so, this is where I kind of felt running in the book. You know, uh, I wrote a book on how companies, you know, operate in a in a and I use sales and operations planning SNOP, which basically is a very, uh, on, in theory, is very fundamental. How do you actually work and orchestrate your business um, from one? What are you going to plan to do? Two, how do you forecast it? Three, do you have the supply to meet the forecast? And then four, make decisions against, uh, from a financial perspective, what do you need to do and repeat the process? And it's a, a process that, in theory, is an excellent process, uh, and it makes all the sense in the world. But there's one major problem with that. There's people that? involved. People. <laughs> and, and, uh, I so, knew it. <laughs> can you believe it? And, and all of us, every single one of us, sit with some type of bias. We really do. Uh, no matter what, we're humans. We, uh, we have some type of view. We are measured differently in what we do. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you drive a forecast, you put that forecast in play, right? Action happens. Capacities are being made. Materials are being bought. Productions being uh, uh, productions being made. Uh, you have caused some type of potential liability, or you've created some type of potential uh, shortage um, by when you're forecasting. And if you take all the inputs from uh, uh, what you need to forecast, you will find there's a lot of bias that will come in either from, hey, you got to meet the financials, so we got to make up a forecast to meet the financial plan. Hey, my product, my new product is going to be uh, the next things in sliced bread, so we got to forecast uh, this like crazy. Uh, you'll find that, hey, this product doesn't make good margins, so we're going to forecast another product that has no chance. Uh, of getting to the uh, to the revenue results or the margin results that you're looking for, but you bring in those type of biases, and that the key then, if you think about it, if that gets into your forecast, you're creating some type of action, and some type of liability, and or you could be creating some type of shortage too. So uh, all these interdependencies come together um, uh, to develop what the outcome is. Will you have a bottle of Casey Masterpiece barbecue sauce on your shelf at the end of the day? Well, you said something that ha I was scribbling it down. I'm going to have to paraphrase you that somebody would want you to forecast for a product that's going to be the next big thing. How do they know it's not proven? Why would that be forecasted? Because you have to buy the material. you got to have the capacity oh. to produce it. you got to have... Uh, You've got to develop the uh, pricing plans, the, the the vendor base that you're bringing together. It's very complex, and so you have to plan for for something, uh, but to uh, not necessarily if you own a specific product, you're not looking at anything else but micromanage on your specific product, and you created a, a business case for your company to invest in, and so it's uh, once you have it, you become biased. Uh, you got come biased to uh, manage those tip product, and it's very hard for people to, you know, it's like having a, it's having a child, right? Once you have a child, you're very biased on that child. But if you kind of step back and like, hey, you know what, this child's not going to necessarily be, you know, a doctor or or you know, uh, um, a uh, the next an uh, astronaut. PhD Everybody or wants astronaut. to be an astronaut. Uh, yeah. Hey, whatever it's be. So, but you become very biased by it, and uh, I think that. There was a someone that taught me like on the on the product side that was a very good view is that you know people that are product managers great I used to be one um, that uh, you you are measured on the success of your product uh, regardless of the interdependencies and so it's very similar to the product manager being a parent in a beauty contest with their kids in it <laughs> so that's going to bias them to voting for their child versus you know, all the other children that are out there. So it develops those biases over time, but that bias getting into the forecast does create some type of uh, downstream issue that you will have to deal with if it's really wrong. Gotcha. Listen, I'm in chapter six and I had bookmarked this. It's called forecasting myths 
and I see on this one page there's seven. Um, and the final one is something we're talking about like crazy online and in business, and that's artificial intelligence. But if you don't mind, can you go through all seven of them very quickly? Sure. So um, not having the, the book in front of me, we, we, just hit, uh, we just hit the ones that uh, uh, I put in the book. I don't have it in front of me. I didn't memorize every single one in the, uh, in the order. Okay, gotcha. The sales team is number one. The sales team knows what to forecast and just needs to apply more effort. Uh, sure, this is my favorite one. So uh, <laughs> this is one of my favorite ones. So, hey, think about this. Um, you know, uh, the sales team actually interfaces with the customer or the next down, downstream pieces. But if you kind of look at the sales team, there's many things the sales team don't know, what the customers don't know. But but many businesses just say, hey, you know, uh, they point to sales as the root cause for the bad forecast. And I look at it as like, well, yeah, but that more turns into a blame game. Let's look at the truth around it. They may not know, right? They may not know interdependencies. So just taking pure input from a sales forecast or driving it will basically most of the time over forecast what you need because each salesperson is trying to make their quota and numbers. And that two, I understand. I, mean, I knew you were going to say that. not know. All right, so there's so many variables. They don't, they don't have a view. And what do they know six months from now when you have to make these decisions today? What do they know nine months from now? No. It's, uh, so just saying, hey, sales uh, is golfing all the time, and uh, they're not paying any attention to the forecast, and they just complain when they don't have product, right? that, to me, you've got to get past that. And you've got to be figure out different ways of what you drive from a forecast perspective with well, sales is a key input, but it's not the, it should not be the do all end all how you forecast. And that makes sense. Listen, I've worked with a lot of sales teams and they, nobody likes them. Nobody because they will. <laughs> no, we're <just> jealous. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, no. this, this, the sales team says, okay, well, you just tell me what you want. We'll make that happen. Then they go to, a, you know, not HR, but, you know, I'm talking mostly about, you know, web type, website type of stuff and, you know, people who work in coding. And they'll go, why did you promise that? We can't do that. Even if we could, yeah. we can't do it in two weeks. Why don't you ask us before you make these promises? But that doesn't happen. There seems to be, at least what I've witnessed, very little communication between who is going to produce the code and who is selling the code or the product that the code will will operate. And then there's a code to figure out what the code is. So, yep. uh, but I, you know, my uh, here's been my philosophy number one, right? But if you are, if anyone sits in supply chain, the first thing you have to do is don't act like you're in supply chain automatically it'll pull up the walls and the excuses that are, hey, the forecast was wrong. You can't commit to this. How did that happen? The, the other way around it is put your arm around your salespeople, right? Right. You look in the same direction. Teach, learn, work together, orchestrate together on what you need to do. Can you do it with everybody? No. But the 2080 rule of every business, 20% of your customers make up 80% of your volume. Work with those folks. Get very, very close to them. They're not the enemy. You won't have a job if we didn't have any sales. So, you know, we go deep in the organization. We rely on it. So accept that as a reality, but don't look to go push blame. Nothing happens. No, and you're just going to cause all kinds of issues, personality issues, personnel issues. It's not good. Make friends. Have coffee. Ask questions. Right. I'm big on asking questions. You know, if you don't know what you don't know, how are you going to be of assistance no matter where you are in the company? So number six, leadership, and that's in little quotes, understands potential consequences of the demand forecast. True or false? <laughs> So this is, uh, I, I like this one too, right? So this demand is a big question, right? But at the end of the day, that demand has to translate into purchasing. It has to translate into capacity. And then even in that demand, right, it's leveraged to use contract negotiations with suppliers. It's used into 
developing uh, what personnel you're going to need, not only capacity, but from people that you're going to need. So if you look at it from that perspective, is that many companies, um, uh, many companies and even leaders uh, will look at demand, but not understand, you know, the consequences behind it. So this is the, I call it the, uh, it's a timing example. Decisions made in August, you will feel the effect to maybe next February, okay? Well, who remembers what the heck happened back in August? Okay? No one knows, right? So that's where it comes down to is you lose sight of how you made decisions. And then when the outcome is not what we like, that de- those decisions were made back here. So we like to focus on the here and now. You cannot snap your fingers. You cannot snap your fingers and make everything better. It, I've tried. It doesn't happen. There's no magic wand. I haven't found that either. It, you can't make you know, uh, uh, instant gratification when it comes to very complex global supply chains. But what you can do is then understand, hey, what's your impact if you do this? What's the impact, potential impact to the business? Understand that. Could we create a liability? Okay, if we have the liability, do we have a backup plan? Could we create a potential shortage? Okay, if that's the case, do we not lower the price? Whatever it happens to be. So the key here, um, the key here is that a lot of people look to uh, to overall leaders, like our CFO said this, or our um, our CEO said this. Maybe not even understanding the consequences to what he or she is saying, are saying, and they don't and uh, they don't fit in the day-to-day uh, areas of the supply chain to understand those impacts. So uh, just because you have, well, so-and-so told me to do it, if it's wrong, right, you're not doing your job, or if they don't necessarily understand the impacts, it's your job to go back and say, hey, you know, if we do this, here's the potential consequences if this doesn't happen. And to me, I hear so many times, well, I drove it because so-and-so told me. Uh, agree, but... When you sat down with so-and-so, you don't have the context of the conversation. They're just looking to check the box and get the job done. But several thousand people, uh, not even within your company, can get impacted because of that decision that was made. So, John, one of the questions that are, or observations that I have in my, my list of notes here is that, and you had said this to me in our pre-interview, that you learned being responsible demand plant during being responsible for demand planning for over 20 years, that someone needs to connect the dots. And I think that's what you're saying right now. Who has to connect the dots? One person, 20 people? How does that operate? Um, that's where the intangibles come in. Uh-huh. And I think, uh, uh, you know, in practice, right, you can take the textbook that says, here's how you should structure your organization. This is how your sales and operations planning should work. But there's a bunch of handoffs. Right. And if the and, and so to me, so, for instance, if a demand planner says, hey, I did I did the job, I loaded the demand that so and so told me or we agreed to. And then we set off and started executing to that demand. Um, the demand planner, the, the demand person that's doing that. Right. Then it gets hand off to the next line of to go deal with something. And then there's a, eventually some type of outcome. To me. That's so important to look at the front end of your uh, planning process. If your demand planning feels accountable for the outcome, it changes the entire mindset. If we can just blame something down the stream, upstream or downstream, we can blame sales. If we can blame uh, leadership, if we can blame uh, the product group, right? Guess what? You're not doing your job. All you're doing is checking the box and letting it go through. Do you understand the consequences? When you push that button on demand and what happens afterwards, it turns all this stuff into the ones and zeros of the organization to say, okay, we're executing to this. And that's really, really important. So the mindset is you have a big responsibility on the demand side, not to salute, but basically help the organization understand what the potential consequences could be if we're not close to it. Uh, if a product launch is delayed, whatever happens to be, what are those consequences? And you have to do it really um, before you get into your, your supply chain lead times. So once you get there, it's very hard to do anything dramatic. 
That makes sense. And like I said in the beginning, I don't understand supply chain at all. Neither you know, do I. The, uh, I'm still learning. <laughs> well, and you should be. We all should be. I mean, I was going to say in, in other, you know, only in terms of how my business works, which is minimal compared to what you're talking about, but I need to understand it. And my team needs to understand it. And I need to hear what they have to say because, you know, we all have what I call in the web developer banner blindness. We'll see the same graphic so many times we no longer see it. It's like seeing that same old billboard. You just don't see it anymore. So if you're not seeing what's happening around you, somebody in your organization or your team needs to say, hey, Denise, do you want to talk about this? I don't think that's going to work. Or I've actually had one say, what the hell were you thinking? That was a good question because I wasn't <laughs> thinking. <laughs> it, 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 and so this is, to me, is a is a opportunity for leadership. I call it, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people are scared of titles, right? So whatever your title is in the company, well, the VP of so-and-so did this, and, oh, the CFO said this. So, uh, okay, I get that, right? They're human beings, too. But the key here is uh, we learn from every aspect, every person you can get in contact, you will learn something. And I call it the view of always being curious. So when you see a, what you initially perceive as a stupid idea um, and you're like, well, that's stupid. We're just going to move on. If you take a moment to say, how did you come to that conclusion? What were the variables you were looking at to, to uh, what were the variables that uh, got you to come to that conclusion? And then when you have the individual start talking through that, one, you'll learn something, right? Maybe it reinforces your opinion as a stupid idea, but many times you'll find, wow, I never thought of that, right? And now I can understand how your mind is operating, why you would, why you're bringing that to the party and both get an education. And if both learn from that, you've now improved. And so to me, breaking down walls within organizations, which is the, I can tell you, uh, even today, it's hard. It's very hard and taxing to continue to do, especially when everyone's uh, at this point, supply chain, everyone's throwing the tomatoes at them. I, we need a supply chain issue on tomatoes now too. So uh, we don't get tomatoes thrown at us anymore, but there's a, there is a, uh, there's quite a, uh, uh, a way that you have to break down the barriers, and you've got to be very approachable. Once you become curious, right, instead of judgmental, it's amazing what you can learn. You listen, it's easy to knee jerk. We're all guilty of it. Oh, but what man, you're saying yeah. is I, back it up and think about it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm really good at it. No, I'll catch myself saying, Denise, sit down, shut up. Think you know, and I have to talk with myself, but we all do it. So what you're saying is basically ask questions, you know, be curious, which I love. I'm intensely curious and connect those dots. Find out what's really going on. Is it doable? Maybe. Is it, you know, was my knee jerk reaction the, the proper one as it turns out? Possibly. But you're not going to know until you ask questions. Yeah, and then you can, and to me, it's like, so if, if once we figure out we, we know everything, we know nothing. I, and right. I, that's got to be the point is that, hey, your title doesn't mean you're smarter. than In fact, <laughs> your title doesn't mean you're smarter. I mean, I kind of feel more like a more like a Forrest Gump than anything. But you got to be able to you but you got to be able to learn, understand and basically uh Bring people to the same common goal. We all have the same common goals at the end of the day for our companies. Yeah, we all want to be, we all want to be compensated very well. We want to be recognized very well. We want a great culture. But the key, right, is that you need, uh, you want your company to be successful. How we get there, right? There's there's thousands of variables, thousands of inputs. But the key is that when you can start simplifying it. And you can actually start understanding and uh, you start motivating. And it's amazing when you can get people rowing uh, in the same direction, not because they have to, because they want to. That changes the whole dynamic. Well, and that's why organizational, organizational I can say it, culture is so important. And that's what <laughs> we're talking about here. Yes. 
And it's the, the culture to me is a, such a difficult conversation because, uh, uh, you know, it is in our every day and every minute interactions. Uh, and, uh, and everyone says, well, I can't influence the culture. Once you're in, you're already in the culture, right? You do have an influence in the culture, how you act, how you behave, how do you, um, interface with your colleagues or how you don't interface with your colleagues, uh, being curious and understanding, uh, that to me, all of us create the culture, but really, uh, to drive and be role models, the higher up, uh, you are in the company, that's where the role modeling of the culture needs to come through. Cause Hey, if you say like, you know, we're going to do this, but you act differently, why as well just say hey, it's okay to uh, it, it's it's for you. It doesn't have to apply to me. That means it's a free for all. So it's gotcha. uh, and I cannot tell you how. And I, I I end my book on to me that is the biggest biggest changes. And I've been in companies that I found to be tremendously tremendously great cultures. And I would say uh, and being able to try even help influence those cultures to even be better. And then areas where the culture wasn't uh, wasn't uh, as mature or good, and you can just tell the the whole difference. Uh, the amount of turnover people had, the success uh, of the company was up and down um, versus systemic uh, process and issues, and being able to attack issues instead of people. Understood. Listen, before I get before I get away from this, because I'm fascinated. With AI, as you can probably figure out, I'm oh. still back in chapter six, yeah. and you know it starts. Do you or your leaders, leaders in your organization, believe the following to be true? Number seven, investing in artificial intelligence AI will significantly improve the demand forecast. True or false? So right now, false. Hey, so by the way, AI has been going on for years. How did how did everyone miss the how did everyone miss the forecast then during the pandemic? Right. <laughs> yeah, I didn't tell us that. So, All of uh, them. <laughs> so, to me, you know, we we like to paint this broad brush in AI, right? And I think to me, there's huge benefits of doing it. In fact, AI, you have to really program it too. But uh, AI. Is a huge, huge benefit. Think of uh, you know trying to fill out complex spreadsheets or data or information that uh, take hours or, or, or even days, right, to put together. Where AI, once you program it, can do it in a matter of minutes. But I hear many companies going, "Hey, you know, we're focusing on AI uh, to improve our demand forecast." I don't know how. I don't know how AI at this point. Maybe again can predict weather because no one can predict the weather still, even hours from now. Right? Who has gotten better at predicting the weather? My cats. Hey, right. so, seriously, so, I do look out cats, the window. Right? Maybe we got to bring your cats. My maybe dog. You I know in the cat. barometric. Yeah, I know when my barometric yeah. pressure has yeah. dropped because my dog starts panting and you know she wants to go into the bathroom with her blankie. There you go. She's better than you know any of them really. Yeah. I watch her. But uh, but but the example is is that you know, there's so many events that happen, thousands, millions of events that happen every day throughout the world. It's it's hard to predict. But I will say where a place for AI is, right? We have a lot of information that everyone's using. We have stuff going into the cloud, and basically what you do in the cloud is you can use your customer information they're giving you. You can use your internal information. You can use your supplier information. And to me, I think AI could help in something called replenishment. So replenishment oh. means it can like trigger saying, hey, this looks like it's going to go out of stock here. Go replenish it. But you can't replenish it unless you have the supply behind it. So those decisions on demand forecasting many times have to be done six, nine, 12 months in advance to be able to replenish. So the key here is that I think AI is something that, by the way, scares scares me, not because I'm worried about losing my job um, because of AI. I'm just worrying as well, does it make us dumber, right, as a, as a, as yeah, a, as a I kinda, organization? Does, do we yeah. actually lose some part of our uh, – 
our ways? And uh, do we actually become, I don't know, more lazier? And then we just worry about uh, maybe less uh, really important stuff. I mean, when we all had to worry about air, water, food, and shelter, that's a different worry than, um, wow, what does so-and-so think of me versus uh, what's my title? You know, those things, uh, you know, can go down a slippery slope. But AI, um, who knows if Arnold Schwarzenegger was right? <laughs> Maybe it will end humanity, but it is, uh, it's just fascinating. But I hear this all the time, AI, 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 got it. But that's kind of like saying, you know, we put a sales and operations process in that we take from a textbook. It solves everything. It doesn't. But there are uses for it. And who knows? Maybe the predictive model will be there. But to me, uh, at the end of the day, it's humans. And what is the most unpredictable thing you can see? Humans are pretty unpredictable. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, and the thing is, John, you know, it's with any technology, you have to train it. You must train it. You need to you know, work with it. You can't just plug something into, let's just say, chat GPT and yes. not do your critical thinking and you right. know, do become your own fact checker because it's just going to spit out what is, what is already out there on the internet. But one of the things that I wanted to, to ask you and, you know, oh, oh, and you said something too, but is it making us dumber? I don't know phone numbers anymore. Who does? They're on our you phone. don't know what? I'm sorry, could you say that again? Phone numbers. I can't remember oh. my own phone number. I don't remember phone numbers. I don't remember email addresses. It's in my phone. Yeah, I'm and, getting a little bit dumber. Well, I don't know if it's dumber, but you might be smart about other things. Like, I still can't get the Brady Bunch out of my head. So that's already <laughs> filled, right, in that space. So that's not going to go away. But, yeah, there's other things uh, I worry about. I mean, I'm not adding... Uh, I'm not using a calculator anymore. I'm using, you know, cosine and sine. Right. It, I'm using tools, right, to, to to help me with the output, uh, deciding what I should do. But, yeah, it's just that you can rely on it. Um, I mean, how many, uh, you know, we just, and we're evolving, right? How many, uh, you know, you got uh, now uh, directions at uh, your command. How many people know how to read a map? Oh, not me. I never could. <laughs> but I Seriously. But I mean, just so we're evolving. It but, is. It but, is. But you can't, but I guess at the end of the day, you're not going to stop it. So understand it, embrace it, and then, you know, where else are you going to be able to provide value or, or learn? And uh, you can't just uh, sit back and just say, well, the past was so much better. Eh, not really. We like to glorify the past. It really doesn't work better. There's a lot of benefits that come out of it too. But yeah, <clears throat> what I do worry about is we lose it. Like I got AI now creating, hey, these these are the characters that uh, should be, you know, cast in movies. Hey, their AI is creating their own symphonies and their own music. What does that look like? So those type of things are coming. Is that uh, is uh, does that start taking away some of our humanness? Don't know. But the key is it's here. We just can't let it um, – I, I just say we can't let it defeat defeat humans, and we don't want to go extinct because we created it. I agree. It's, you know, it's like anything else. You have to work with it, train it, understand it. So, John, what I wanted to ask you is what are some of the biggest trends or upcoming developments in your industry that you're excited about right now? Well, the uh, you know, I would say one of the big ones is that taking, you know, the, every, you know, ERP systems, which companies run off up to run <laughs> systemically their entire business, um, it's hosting data in uh, what they call the cloud. And uh, and with that, right, they're bringing in some artificial intelligence. I think some of the key is that <laughs> what's exciting just to overall is the analytics that AI can help us provide. Um, but this data has to be clean. It has to make sense. It has to map to each other and it, it, uh, to actually get to a result. But to me, we're in a, this mode of uh, uh, this digital transition um, you know, into the cloud where you can actually now share information, uh, uh, information across companies that you haven't had in, in the past necessarily. And from that perspective, you can uh, you know, make better decisions um, it's still early in the stage, but 
uh, all ERP systems have moved to cloud-based ERPs, basically. And um, <coughs> utilizing that data is important. Um, uh, and with that, you see the speeds of the networks continue to get better across the, across the world. So accessing those, uh, those networks are getting better. But uh, how we use it, how we manage it, you know, it's, uh, and you know, what we leverage from it, what we have to be certain is what we use, what the output's spitting out, you're still challenging it. doesn't make sense. So there's a gut feel. But uh, it is helping in mouth. The amount of information we can glean now that it's uh, more coordinated, it's incredible. I've seen uh, uh, incredible dashboards and kind of intelligence. Um, but a lot of it's focused on the now and the past and maybe what's upcoming in the next uh, couple of weeks. Like it has not done much for, hey, what's the, the potential future hold? So I think it'll spend, so it'll get some time where it becomes more sophisticated to be more predictive uh, in the future. But uh, to me, it's created a whole new, uh, a whole new avenue to mine and leverage data to turn it to information and actionable information that this world's never seen before. And that makes sense. So, so tell me what inspired you to pursue your current career in this industry. It seems like you'd have to have a particular kind of mind to want to do what you you do. Uh, um, let's get back to the uh, that's a stupid idea part. Uh, I worked uh, I worked eighteen Sorry. years. At, I worked eighteen years at Motorola, and you know I was a I was a product manager at the time, and just to date myself, I mean I actually had brick phones. Uh, it was one of my products uh, over you know back, back years ago. In a, in hey, a, I have to let me interrupt you. I uh, I have to tell you, I interviewed Marty Cooper. He invented yeah. that phone. Yes, my uh, yes. I uh, love Marty. By the way, uh, yep. great guy, uh, I'm a huge fan, and another example of like at Motorola, we had great innovation, but it's gone. And actually, Motorola was very inspirational. Uh, say the company would have got so big, but it crumbled under its own weight. Um, because it wasn't orchestrated very well. But back to you know back to this. I I, uh, I here's how it, I got into supply chain. Number one is I uh, had a product manager. We were getting later and later in the technology, and we were getting farther away from launching product on time. And um, finally, we got a product that you know was nine months, twelve months late to market. Finally, got there. And we finally got it approved to go start shipping. And then there was some part or supply chain issue we couldn't ship. So I had a uh, meltdown. <laughs> it was classic, too. It was very good. One of my best. Um, the next day, I had a talk to my manager. I was like, you know what? I think you do, you do well in this job in supply chain. There you go. That, that taught me a lesson. But I learned something very valuable. Uh, that, you know, I, I was, uh, what I, my, when I got into type of supply chain roles, I was able to decipher things differently than some of the people that were in the supply chain roles for a while. Why? Well, I knew the inputs that were coming in. I'm like, well, this is BS. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Oh, we're assuming perfection. That's not going to happen. And then you could say, hey, based off that, what if we have to do something, you know, uh, something different with other products because this is really not going to happen. You start challenging it. And what I found is that, hey, as human nature, we love that what we do is to call, throw things over the wall, meaning, okay, I did my job. Now I'm going to leave it up to the thing. I'm going to have no accountability. I'm going to send this, uh, throw the ball over the wall. And then the same thing happens. You throw the ball over the wall. But at the end of the day, it's like a, a telephone game. You remember the telephone game we played as kids where you would whisper in something, someone's ear, and you go all the way to the end, and a whole different answer came out? Yep. Yep. That's gossip. So you say it up we call front, that you whisper gossip. something in the ear, and then it gets to the end person, they say something completely different. That's how, it was, that's how it's working. So the key then is how do you want to get to the outcome, but you got to start up front of making sure that the, the teams are all aligned to say, hey, we're not going to throw over the ball the wall, over the wall. We're going to create the outcome. And I've learned by trial and tribulation that um, 
and still fail in many instances. But the key here is to me is that first person that's talking wants to get to that outcome, not, hey, let's see it screw up, uh, screw up at the end and we laugh at it. It's bad for everybody. So that's how uh, I kind of moved into it and then uh, created some, uh, I would say, more improvements uh, to the financial results of the organization and even some of the culture by breaking down walls and those barriers. And don't throw the ball over the wall, right? It's a, we like to blame that person at the end saying, you screwed up. No, there's something in that variable chain that didn't go wrong. So how do you align that chain? And it's just a fascinating, uh, uh, been a fascinating experience for me to keep uh, trying to improve that. Well, and that leads me to my next kind of question or observation. What kind of challenges have you faced along the way? And, you know, how have you overcome them? Were there any times where you just said, heck, I'm going to throw the ball myself. Everybody duck. <laughs> I, uh, there's been many times I said, I'm just going to pick up the ball and go home. Oh. <laughs> so I'm picking my ball and going home. Uh, it's, uh, so first off, it's definitely not for the it, – it, it's a – very, very challenging. Um, and I guess I could have put it, and this is this is not to be a slight, but you, you kind of be, you kind of got to be like a chess player. But to me, there's, uh, you have to balance four aspects of your business. Okay. So you got to hit the revenue, right? And so in order to hit the revenue, you, uh, you got to have the right product at the right time or the right services at the right time uh, and the right pricing to sell. Number two, you gotta you gotta manage the cost. So you gotta have the margin of the business that you want to make money. So revenue and cost. The other thing is cash flow. So how you manage your cash flow? A lot of it comes down to inventory. So you gotta have you can't have too much inventory. And you can't have too little inventory. Um, from a cash flow perspective. And then fourth is the customer experience, which is many companies is on time delivery. The key is is that many uh, organizations have people just really focused in one of those four buckets. And so, for example, salespeople mostly are not in the profitability. They're really into hey, getting the revenue, uh, you know, at all costs, potentially. Uh, you may have from a cost perspective that you just have cost accounting, uh, and then you've got uh, purchase, purchasing or, or sourcing, just trying to get lower pricing from your uh suppliers, even though it may add more cost with the lower price you use. It's all those aspects. So to me is that you got to kind of sit in the center of that, right? And so you got to manage all these four buckets, which many compete against each other equally. So it's been a, it's been challenging because uh, if you, um, you have too much potentially over, overdo do too much revenue, you could end up having uh, uh, shortages in the, in, the, in the inventory and or you could be adding too much uh, uh, adding too much cost to get to that revenue. So you have to balance it. And so it's been quite the challenge uh, to balance it, and it's been quite the education. But many times you got to kind of have some thick skin. And, and I continue to uh, continue. You've got to kind of rise above the fray. And keep uh, and, and keep the eye on the prize. How do you make sure your business continues to be sustainable? You have people that want to be within that business, and you want to drive success for you and your business. Because uh, depending on what function or what you are in the organization, you know you're only focused on a smaller subset of variables, and you got to look across it. And so that to me, um, it's been a uh, incredible journey of learning for me, but it also has taken great, uh, uh, I would say, uh, great uh, 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 amount of uh, not taking things personally. I've been... I'm going to uh, go with Tom's. You, you're going yeah, to need yeah, an right. assets by your hands. <laughs> but, but in the hospital, but if you think about it, when, you, uh, when you're successful, the company's successful, I mean, your company's successful. Um, you keep employees. Um, you actually, if you make your your customers successful, that helps you. And if you keep your company, so if you keep your suppliers successful, that helps them. So it's very, you know, uh, you know, 
it's very important of the thousands of people that you can actually potentially help that have no idea that uh, you may be a little input to helping, you know, their success and sustainability. Um, just remember uh, going into, you know, living in the 90s and the you know, 2000s, we brought all these executives in, only to pay them millions of dollars to leave and watch the business uh, fade. And that uh, took a personal toll on me. Like, how many thousands of people did we have to fire because um, uh, our, our executive teams were a little more worried about their own success versus the overall picture? And to me, that's the it's very, very difficult, uh, uh, very, very difficult to look across the organization and manage the organization. But at the same point, you got to realize that some of the sacrifices you're doing personally really benefits many, many people that you don't even know. And, um, you know, you actually answered a question that I was going to ask, and that was how do you stay motivated and continue to grow in your profession? And you, you know, picked my mind there. You, you already knew what I wanted to ask you. So my next question is, but this one's important. I'm very curious to see what you have to say is what advice would you give to someone just starting out in your industry? Just in, you know, in supply chain in general, I, I would say uh, be curious. I mean, you have to be curious. Uh, if you if you will come into logistics, do you come into demand planning? If you come into sourcing, uh, if you are actually coming into purchasing, whatever roles in supply chain that you're taking, um, I say you have to be uh, curious. But I think the best uh, the the best uh, the best people have a broad base of experience. So, to me. Look to get some customer interface experience. Look to get supplier interface experience. Look to get your own production and factory and or uh, experience. Get some product knowledge experience. Get more experiences in here. For those that understand the customers well, that understands your internal company well, and know your suppliers well, very few people can bridge those paths. Once you can, or be, have a much better uh, understanding of how the supply chain works. Supply chain is not your company. <laughs> supply chain has many thousands of companies involved in that. So you always have a customer. You always have what you're doing. You always have a supplier behind you. So understand those elements and be curious and grow and learn. Uh, you will make mistakes. You will have bad bosses. You will have good bosses. But at the end of the day, stay true to learning. Because if uh, you don't, and you, you uh, to me, if you just keep pushing blame, you will not grow. Because there's plenty of blame to go around. But if you oh, focus yeah. on that, you will not grow. And that leads me, and I love that you're curious. I mean, I'm intensely curious. And I learn every time I have somebody come on this show, I learn something that I didn't know before. In fact, I've started keeping track in each episode. I learn at least three things that I had no clue about before I met you. So one of the questions I have for you too, and we're just about to run out of time is what are some of the most important skills that you've developed throughout your career and how have you honed them? <laughs> um, uh, I got to tell you, I'm very good at going to bars right now. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm breaking, in the deep breaking bread, your, breaking bread with your uh, breaking bread with your counterparts is very important. So those Here's interpersonal, golf. those interpersonal soft skills and uh, uh, you know are stuff that have to be honed over time and breaking down walls. And so I, I tell you, um, I've been called a genius many times. But none of that is because it's a flattering term. So um, it, you uh, you uh, so you got to stay uh, you got to stay humble because you always have something else to learn. But I think the the, the biggest skill set to learn, at least for me, was um, just because your title says so. There's there's ways you can challenge a decision without looking like a naysayer, right? You have to break down the barriers with those type of individuals, regardless of title, regardless of title. You, know, you got to learn to understand it. And so that's one skill set I had to learn. For my first half of my career, I was like, well, there's a VP of supply chain. So, yeah, 
Jimmy's. I got to do what they say. So I look good. Maybe a horrible decision. You learn over time to say, how do you take that? You look and say, why do you think it's a horrible decision? And how you constructively then go back and say, hey, you know, if we do this, you know what's going to be there? That this could be a huge impact for us and this impacts this. So learn to why you think it's a horrible decision, but then you've got to start working regardless of what title he or she is in the organization and be able to break down those barriers. And so that was a big change for me, um, you know, a big change for me uh, going up. Once I kind of took people's titles out of the equation that, hey, they put on the pants the same way I do. Most of the time I put my pants on first before shoes. But anyway, that's the uh, uh, that's one of the biggest, biggest changes is like don't don't get intimidated by the title. Once you do that, uh, you stop thinking. See, my title is Cat Wrangler. Out of everything I do, that's the thing I do the most. So, but you know, you know what I wanted to ask you too is that wow, well, I just lost it, and it was very, very important. Oh, I know what it was. I wrote it down. What I'm hearing you say is that you have learned and operate under the think and listen and ask kind of program. You listen. You probably hear things that people aren't actually saying. If you're like me, you're you're picking things out of the ether, you know, more or less, than, because it's instinct. And then you ask questions. It goes back to that curiosity. Yeah, um, and I think that's that's what's key. That you know, that's what's key. Um, and I would add one more, right? Is can you uh, t- to me is that. Can you develop sustainability, meaning uh, can you bring people uh, to, to improve uh, their skill sets and levels where they can, as a, you create and manage that, uh, that process can be now be managed with another person that can necessarily own it. And we only have a short time on this earth, but if we leave and then everything falls apart, what did, what did we do? What we didn't uh, we didn't work on creating something systemic, sustained, and we didn't uh, help grow and maintain the people we needed to take stuff on. So to me, it's really really important uh, to bring these experiences in there, and then having uh, the availability of having a team being able to do that. The best experience I ever had is uh, one of the companies that I left. I did not get replaced. Uh, Four people got promoted to divide up what we're doing, and it's working great. And that's, that's a, to me, that's success. Nice. That's a great story. Listen, before I let you go, um, is there anything else you want the audience to know? Any tips, advice, or just last-minute thoughts? Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, just uh, – as so you may not, may or may not know, I'm very passionate uh, about the subject and probably one of the biggest geeks on the subject. Um, but I always say is that if there's a, uh, if, if there's anything you can glean, I've, uh, I've I wrote a book about it because of my passion about this aspect of hey, how do you take bias out of the forecast? Because it has so many uh, downstream effects on your company. Is how can you do that? It's more of a, uh, it's not a, a dry supply chain textbook. It actually is uh, got some humor in it. But the reality is, is that uh, I hope you can take two or three things away. If uh, uh, you look at it and then uh, potentially change the way that you uh, approach or see things. Because once you change the way you approach and see things, it becomes a, a, a different level of how you will uh, manage and engage uh, so if you can take some snippets, and I've had actually many of my suppliers, uh, our supply partners that have taken the book and read it, but reality, they've made some changes with their own organization, and um, they've, I feel they've gotten somewhat better. I'm biased by that, but the key is if you can take two or three takeaways and take it with you, I hope I can bring that, uh, uh, share that knowledge with you. Well, I have the book, as we all know, and there's, there's some great humor in it. The forward starts out with, I played Beat the Mink and Lost. Yes. By Patrick Murray, the vice president of global, global supply chain at Residio. Yes. Now, is that for me? Resid- How do you say Residio, that? Residio, yes. Aha. Uh-huh. That was a while, uh-huh. guess. 
But yeah. anyway, everybody who is listening, grab the book. I think you can find it on Amazon. Where can people find you before I let you go? Okay, so really, John Mink, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best way to, to get a hold of me if you would like. Um, I'm uh, very uh, passionate about this topic because, to me, success breeds success, and failure breeds success when you can learn. And I think that's uh, that's very, very critical and uh, the perspective that I feel where I'm at now is much different than where I was 15 years ago. And it's a continual amount of uh, learning. But man, when you get to great results and sustainability, that's the best reward of all. This has been a fascinating chat. And I thank you so much for coming on the show. And honestly, supply chain, I mean, I'm, you're aware of it because you're aware of it mostly when you can't find what you want. We are spoiled in this nation. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I say that with all love and respect, but we're spoiled. I mean, we have just about everything on demand, it seems like. But this has been fascinating, and it's something that I knew nothing about. So me being as curious as you are, I wanted to know more, and I thank you for showing up. So everybody, before we wrap up our today's episode, if you've enjoyed the episode with me and with John Mink and found his insights helpful, please leave us a review and rating on iTunes. And your feedback helps me improve and reach more people on their own success journeys. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button, leave a review, and share your part in success radio with your friends and your colleagues. And then go find, find John Mink. So thank you for tuning in, and we will catch you on the next one. John, thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. I really, my pleasure. Get your voice heard. If you would like to launch your own far-reaching podcast, contact Denise Griffiths at yourofficeontheweb.com and go to the podcast tab. 